Welcome to this last video lecture in the Intralingual Re-Speaking module. My name is Pablo Romero Fresco. I work at the University of Vigo in Spain, where I lead the research group Calma uh, on media accessibility. Now, the plan for this Unit 4 is to look into advanced intralingual re-speaking and more specifically into how to assess the quality of re-spoken subtitles. Quality in re-speaking could be down to different issues, could be measured through the use of different issues or parameters such as delay, speed, uh, accuracy, difficulty, cost or, or errors. Um, we've seen that in Unit 1, but today I'd like to focus on, or for this unit, I'd like to focus on accuracy. Now, in order to um, look into the basic requirements for a model of assessment, uh, one could argue that this model of assessment should be functional and easy to apply. It should include the basic principles of WER, where error rate um, calculations. Um, this is something that is normally used in speech recognition. It should be acknowledging, you should acknowledge that different types of programs or events require different type of editing or reduction in the subtitles. It should account for the possibility of edited subtitles that are actually accurate. Uh, it should be able to compare subtitles with the original spoken text. It should include relevant information regarding delay, position and speed that is not only accuracy. And at the same time, it should provide with both a percentage of accuracy rates and also food for thought in terms of training. Now, traditional word error rate methods such as the one used by the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology have this formula that you can see on the screen, uh, the number of words minus the number of errors divided by the number of words, multiplied by 100, and then you get your accuracy rate. So if we compare this sentence with the way in which it's been recognized, we can see that some words have been deleted others have been substituted and another one has been um, added or inserted. Now the interesting thing here is that if we apply this formula with the number of words minus those words that have been deleted, substituted or inserted divided by the number of words, cases like this one where imagine that you have an audio of a, or a video of a, prison, of a footballer saying well you know you have to try and put out a good performance I mean yeah it's kind of a stepping stone isn't it really if that was to be subtitled as you have to try to put out a good performance it's a stepping stone then that would probably obtain around a 16% accuracy rate using this model when a lot of us would agree that what's been eliminated or edited out in the subtitles there is probably not important or not um, as important as it, as it would seem. Therefore, the accuracy should be better or higher. So when we use that kind of model, um, we can't comply with those principles or requirements that we established before. Um, some of them, as you can see, uh, do, would not apply, would not be, would not be uh, taken into account. Now, drawing on, uh, I mean, I'll be talking mostly about a model of assessment called the NAM model. And this draws on work that was done um, by the National Center for Accessible Media, and more specifically with the Caption Accuracy Metrics Project that had a survey for caption viewers and then rank the different errors that could be found in live captions. So that, that's important. Uh, at the moment there's also um, a project looking at automatic closed captioning quality um, with the subjective uh, kind of assessment of the viewers using uh, AI technology but this is something that is ongoing at the moment. In any case what's important here is that as was established by the first project that um, I mentioned here, there is a wide range of error types in real-time captioning or in live subtitling, and they are not all equal in terms of the impact that they have on the viewers. So they say, treating all errors 
the same does not provide a true picture of caption accuracy. This is at the heart of the NER model, which is what we're going to be covering now, which has the following formula, um, a number of words minus edition errors minus recognition errors divided by the number of words in the respoken subtitles multiplied by 100 and that gives you your um, accuracy rate. You then leave out of that but you still calculate the correct editions that is those instances in which the audio has been mm, kind of modified in the in the subtitles without losing information and then you have an assessment where you include information that is not just about accuracy but also about delay and etc. The target that you're looking at here, uh, looking at here, um, for for kind of um, good enough live subtitles will be 98%. Now, the types of errors in the NAM model are somehow related to um, three types of errors that were obtained or that were ascertained with with this project, the DTV for all project. And this was done through um, surveys with the users. So the first type of error is one about which the users said, there are errors, yes, but you can easily figure out what the correct form was meant to be. I'm deaf, I'm not stupid. The second type of error is the one that corresponds to this comment by viewers, which is, thanks to live subtitling, I'm not bilingual, I can speak English and teletext. And the third type of error would correspond to this statement, which is, as far as I'm concerned, they are not errors, but lies. So the first ones are minor recognition errors or minor addition errors. That is, the meaning is still clear, the meaning of the original, even though there's an error there. The second type would be standard addition or recognition errors. There is an error there, there is loss of information, the meaning is not clear. And in the third one, a series addition or recognition error, which is penalized with a minus one, there is misinformation. There is what the, view, the viewers called, called a lie in that slide. Let's have a look at, at recognition errors first. So if we look at minor recognition errors, we're looking at a scoring of minus 25, minus 0 0.25. These are errors where the meaning of the original is not really affected. So what a great goal by Ryan Giggs. Well, sorry, what a great goal by a Ryan Giggs, which would be corrected as what a great goal by Ryan Giggs. I mean, the insertion of an A there, it's really not having an, a massive impact on comprehension at all. Simon Brown as opposed to Simon Brown. So a, a capital B that was missing there. Again, it doesn't impact on comprehension. Four people, four people the preposition and the number most viewers can actually understand what that meant what that what, what the original kind of um, meaning was there so these are called minor recognition errors and they're only penalized with minus 0 0.25 if we move on to standard errors we have something like this one he's a buy you a bull asset now for most viewers this would be puzzling they, this is nonsense and they would just they would just lose information only a few viewers would realize that the original here was he's a valuable asset which means that that's a standard recognition error penalized with 0 0.5 again the second example is it really a tentation if we read it out maybe one can guess what the original was but when you're just not reading it out but just looking at the subtitles in passing very quickly it's not easy to know exactly what the audio was which is is it really a temptation so again you lose information um, you recognize it as an error this is key not only do you lose information but you actually recognize that as an error so you know it's an error you don't know what that's about that's a standard error then minus 0 0.5 now serious recognition errors in contrast are not detected as errors. They are not seen as such. Public funding for universities has been cut by 50% this year. Now, most viewers would not, wouldn't know if they have no access to the audio that that's an error because the actual audio said 15%. These are called serious recognition errors or lies because they are misinforming the viewers 
and often the viewers will not have a chance to know that what they read was an error. He never talks to Dirty, he never talks to Rudy. Again, unless the context makes it clearer, then you have no way of knowing that that was a mistake or that there was a mistake there. That's what a viewer would call a lie. And that's a series error that is penalized as minus one. Now these are recognition errors, but we also have edition errors. And, and before we get to that, I'm showing you quite a crude example of, of, a, of an error here. One of those that normally makes it to the media. Firefighters to deal with not just the fire with people in the middle of the road ejaculating. Now, obviously, most people would just read it, they would read this and laugh. And the fact that they laugh is um, showing us that it's a standard error rather than a serious error. Because if somebody laughs, it's, it's because they recognize something as, as an error. That's a sign of um, standard recognition error. Whereas a serious error would be the one that is not detected. Therefore, this one being detected means it's a 0 0.5 standard recognition error, as is the case for most of the errors that make it to the news. Now, edition errors. For this, it's crucial to make a difference between independent idea units, which are normally sentences. They may be made up of several idea units, uh, smaller, which are dependent idea units, uh, and it makes sense as a full message. That's the oral equivalent of a sentence. Whereas a dependent idea unit would be normally a complement. It would be uh, providing information about the when, the where, the how, the why of an independent idea unit. Um, these two examples are examples of independent idea units. And within those units, as you can see, for example, in the second one, the blaze started, I mean, the first one is the two victims of a fatal fire in Melbourne are yet to be formally identified. That would be an independent idea unit. Just as the blaze started this morning at the front of a house would be another independent idea unit. The second one has these two dependent idea units. The when this morning and the where at the front of the house. Now, what we're saying here is that if a full independent idea unit is omitted, that will be a standard edition error. If a dependent unit is omitted, that will be a minor edition error. So, a minor edition error is the omission of a dependent idea unit that doesn't render the whole unit meaningless or nonsensical. And we're saying this because sometimes by omitting a minor idea unit, or sorry, by omitting a dependent idea unit, um, what's left in the caption in the subtitle is just nonsensical, in which case you'd be looking at the equivalent of omitting that full independent unit, uh, and that would be a standard error. But normally, the omission of a dependent idea unit is a minor error. A standard error would be the omission of a full independent idea unit, or as we said before, of a full sentence. Um, it could also be a standard error when, as, as I mentioned, uh, a dependent unit is omitted and then suddenly what's left there is meaningless. Finally, a serious edition error is not very common. Um, it's the addition, the rephrasing, the change, the modification of the original in a way that a change of meaning is caused. And that will be a misinformation or a lie. Like I said, that's not very common. The rare model, that's the formula again, um, is used in different countries at the moment. As you can see, those countries in green are countries where the NER model is being used by different types of institutions. Um, FERS has been adopted by the Canadian governmental regulator CRTC as part of a new official guidelines and legislation. It's included in the official um, Spanish standard of subtitling. It's been adopted by the Brazilian regulator um, in its uh, updated official subtitling guidelines. It was used by the British British government or regulator Ofcom to assess the quality of, of live subtitles in the UK. And then it's used by broadcasters like the BBC in the UK um, and different companies. And, and in that case, it's not just for assessment purposes, but also for training. So, so Reese speakers are trained with the model, which helps them to uh, increase their um, accuracy rates and also to 
to know which errors need to be corrected on the basis of or depending on whether they are minor, standard or serious errors. Uh, and finally, the NAM model is also used by regulators, broadcasters, companies and universities in other countries such as those that are included on the slide. Um, just to finish with this um, last unit in the Intralingual Respeaking module, um, there are some resources av available in this unit and they include um, articles and flowcharts on how to use an M model. There are um, examples of further examples of students' work, um, so exercises where you can see students really speaking and the feedback and comments that they received. And finally, your own exercises if you want to take some of those um, to practice, in this case, advanced really speaking and the use of the NAM model to be able to assess your work. This is it. This is the end of um, the last video lecture of this module 2A on intralingual really speaking. I hope it's been useful and I hope you have some time to check out the rest of the material in this unit, um, in the rest of the units within this module and of course the rest of the modules in this ILSA course and I hope that they are, they are helpful, um, which is um, the very reason why we have um, done all this. So good luck with the course and thank you very much for your attention.